Welcome to the Parents Program Guide. I'm Jane Curtis, the author of the guide, which has been recently revised from the 1997 original edition. Uh, the guide, let's move on to what is the Parents Program. It is 15 family literacy and parenting lessons based on reading children's picture books. And this was originally 13 lessons and with input from family literacy practitioners who had used the original guide in 1997 uh, and then we had a focus group in 2001. Everybody said give some more time to discipline and punishment which are the middle lessons in the guide and so the, the program was extended to 15 lessons. Um, and in addition they were uh, they asked for more writing so that's why this revised edition is longer and has more lessons. One thing you need to know is that lessons can be used as standalones or in combinations of two or more. If you want to just do an evening presentation or uh, a short cycle for learners, you can do two lessons, four lessons, five lessons, and just use the handouts, the videos, the children's books, and you don't need to do all 15 lessons. So it's a much more flexible module to um, really be useful to you in any way that works in your literacy program. The handouts, there are more handouts in this edition of the guide. Everybody said they wanted, their learners wanted more handouts. It's more opportunity for learners to be reading, to improve their literacy skills. Uh, so there's a lot more handouts uh, there in their own section in the guide, which we'll get to as we move through the guide. The books, the handouts, and the videos all can be used to train tutors. You can use this in your basic tutor training when you introduce family literacy, or you can use it for family literacy tutors. So the program has a lot of, uh, I would say, flexible applications. It's not just uh, only to be used for 15 sessions for uh, parents and uh, caregivers of young children. So that's, that was one of the main reasons that we revised the guide was to make it more useful to everyone in the field. And hopefully everyone who's watching this has their guide in front of them and can follow along because the purpose of this video uh, is to walk you through it and get you excited about what's in the guide and to see how it can be useful to you in your programs. Uh, what are the benefits to the students that you serve? Why should you undertake this project? What good is it to buy more children's books, to organize a program, to get people together? Well, there's lots of benefits to the students that you serve. Mainly, they get experience in reading aloud. Every lesson has a children's book, at least one, where everybody takes a turn to read aloud. And what we know is that the more you practice, the better you get. So it's a safe place for learners to read aloud, especially when you have a small group. Another great benefit to students is that while they're improving their literacy skills, they're learning parenting information. And we all know that when you're learning a new skill, if the content is relevant to you and interesting to you and something that you want to learn, you learn better. You learn more. Uh, additionally, as we all know from FFL and other family literacy projects that we do, that one of the main reasons that we do these programs and give away children's books is that if we want our learners to read, it really helps to have a good book to read at home. So we help build home libraries for uh, our learners and for the children in their lives. As I referred to earlier, this edition of the guide has more writing. It has more writing in the homework. It has more writing done in class sessions. So your learners will have an opportunity to practice their writing skills. Uh, we're always looking for some hard product evidence of the improvement of our learners' reading and writing abilities. And built into this program are opportunities for your learners to do more writing. Additionally, what we find is that when people are not real confident in their literacy skills, they're often not real confident in their ability to advocate for themselves. So 
the, uh, another really beneficial uh, byproduct of the parents program is that learners gain their speaking skills. They improve their speaking skills because they participate in a group. The group can be two, three, four, up to eight, ten, whatever size group you get together. But as time goes on, they build safety and they get better and better at really letting people know how they feel about something, expressing their opinion, which, as we know, is a big element in advocating for yourself and for your children. Sort of an extension of that is that learners build a support system. They make friends, uh, they get other information from people in similar situations to, that they're in. So the, the learners in the group support each other. They support each other not only in their parenting skills, but also in practicing reading and writing and gaining confidence in reading aloud to their kids. So students benefit greatly from this program. Again, whether you do all 15 lessons or whether you do five or six or even one or two, it is something that um, they get a whole range of skill development from reading and writing to parenting. So what about your literacy program? How does that benefit? For me, I think uh, we have learned over the years that when we provide projects that start and they end, it's not an ongoing service, that sometimes we reach people that we, we don't reach in our traditional programs. So you can serve a greater number of students in groups than you can one-to-one. -one. So if you have a waiting list and a lot of them have children, then you can create this program, you can offer this to those students so you can serve them while they're waiting to be served in a more traditional way. So there are other students who don't really want to commit to ongoing tutoring for six months, which is usually our minimum. So you can have students come on board, they can do this 15-hour project, they can participate in the 15 lessons and they get a certificate and you have served them, they have met their goal, they've completed a program. Many of our programs have students whose children have aged beyond the magic number of five, which is the um, FFL mandate is to serve children under five. And those students want to keep learning about how to be good parents to their children. And the parents program provides them an opportunity both with uh, practicing books, reading books, choosing appropriate books, learning parenting skills for children pretty much up to the age of 12. We don't cover adolescence, that's another whole ball game. Uh, the other really powerful piece of the parents program is that it is a, an outreach. You can recruit students or partner with other agencies that you might not otherwise connect with or be able to serve. It's a wonderful project to offer to a church group. You can offer to provide it to a rehab center. You can offer to provide it to Head Start or Even Start or other, other agencies that have common uh, target populations that literacy programs usually have. And it is an offer that you can make and you can probably actually get paid to do that some sort of memorandum of understanding with another agency, you provide this, you deliver a product for them. In addition, we are all continuing to need data for reports, to write grants, and all of those reports and grant writing requires evaluation and some sort of measurable outcomes. And this was another reason that the guide was revised, it was to create more uh, tools for you to collect data so that you could come up with a measure for the progress that your students have made. And I'll go over those a little bit more as we move through this presentation. I think last and certainly not least for me is that when you provide this kind of programming to learners in your community and you partner with other agencies, the literacy program and the library gain visibility. You gain respect. You are seen to deliver a product that is, uh, touches people, that's successful, that um, 
proves its success through hard data and that students can actually com complete something. So in the, f in the ways that the program is able to be delivered, you have a lot of flexibility and a lot of benefits to your program. I'm going to move on to the actual inside of the guide and right at the beginning is the table of contents. This is the beginning of the table of contents and what I'm going to do is focus on the definition of terms so that you'll understand as we move into the guide what are we talking about and what do I need and what do I need to look at. After this part of the table of contents we get into the lessons, the handouts and the book lists. This is just the first part. So the definition of terms, the key, the core to this program are the children's picture books. And they have been termed home books or read aloud together books. They're all paperbacks. They are the instructional tool that each lesson is built around. They're called home books or read aloud together books because it depends on how much money you have. If you can afford for each learner to take home a book at the end of each lesson, they are home books. If they are books that the learner can take home but needs to bring back because you can't afford to give away those books, they're read aloud together books. But they serve the same function. Each learner has a copy of the book. They can look at it during the um, class session. When it's their turn to read, they can read their page or not, but they can follow along. They get a little bit safer each class uh, so that as the third, fourth, fifth lessons come around, learners who may not want to read will go for it. Um, the show books. Show books are your classroom library collection, and those are the books that you choose to support the topic of each lesson. Those books are chosen by you to reflect the population that you're serving. And in supporting the topics of each lesson, you'll see that you have some choice. You can pick characters in books that are animals, which apply to any ethnic group. You, if you have a, a large Hispanic population, you can find books that are bi bilingual. And if you have a, a larger African-American population, you can find books with characters that are African-American. So that collection is about 80 books. And depending on your finances, again, those books you can take out of the library. You can collect them together. If you're only providing a couple of lessons or if you're doing just a couple of evenings, you don't need to buy those books. But they are to show learners what a wonderful range of resources they have at the library with all these great children's picture books. Teacher read aloud books are books that unfortunately at the current time are not available as paperbacks. They are books that are wonderful books. They support the topic and they're only available in hardcovers. So you only buy one of those as you do with the show books so that the teacher can model reading aloud during the class session and at the same time learners can see that that's a, that's a book that's available to them and you don't need to have the expense of buying you know eight or ten copies that are hardcovers but it's a book that has great value in the lesson gift books are well they're like the grand prize at the end of the course the, the home books or the read aloud together books were chosen by the course. So those are books that the, um, the course itself has said, we think these are good books, we're buying these, you will practice reading them, and you can take them home for your home library. The gift books are books that learners choose themselves. They choose one for each child in their life. It can be a hardcover, it can be a paperback. And they also choose a gift book for themselves, some, some uh, parent resource book that they've been introduced to during the session that they really liked, that they will read, that's relevant to them. They get to get a gift book uh, for themselves or for a caregiver in their family. So gift books are the opportunity for learners to use everything they've learned as they've gone through the course no matter how many lessons you've offered them, 
and select a book that is personal to the children and that they like and that they want to read and that they can exercise their age-appropriate selection of children's picture books at the end of the course. And they get that along with their certificate of completion. And it's, qu it's quite appreciated. More definition of terms. These are activities that are uh, present in the guide and that are particularly significant. Uh, they are moments where there are uh, opportunities for learners to write. And there are also opportunities for learners to reflect and discuss and come to a place where what are my values and they're called what are my values because we know that we provide information but really people make parenting and other decisions based on their own values there we are not asking them to accept what we say is the right way to be a parent or the right way to do something we give them an opportunity to assess the information that we provide them and that's being truly literate when you can assess the information and does this work for me? Does this mesh with my values? So in lessons two, seven, and 13, there are opportunities for learners to write those down. In lesson two, which is right after the introduction and orientation lesson, they have an opportunity to say, what are the goals that I want for my children? How, how what kind of people do I want my children to be? And that, again, is what are their values about their ideas about good people for their, uh, that they have for their children's identity and their children's maturity. Lesson seven is about role models, and it has to do with what are my values in terms of being a good role model. What is my idea about being an ideal parent, a mother or a father? And in lesson 13, it's values about family and what kind of family values did I receive and what kind do I want to pass on. So these are very powerful activities and they're a wonderful opportunity both for self-reflection, articulation and group discussion and an opportunity again to write down something, practice writing and to have that be a very personal activity. Uh, handouts. Every lesson has at least one handout. Some have more than one handout. And obviously they are used to reinforce the theme of the lesson. Most of them are fairly easy to read with a good bit of white space, but they are also used as references. So you don't read every handout in every class session. You may ask learners to take them home, to look them over, to bring them back if they have any questions. They're also an opportunity to have learners practice their literacy skills. There are tables to read and you have an, uh, an opportunity to teach how to navigate reading a table. You know that many forms use tables and many uh, things that learners need to complete involve navigating a table. So it's a great opportunity for them to practice that. Then there are the famous surveys and questionnaires. These are the ways that we gather our data. And a lot of times, many of us go, oh, another survey, another questionnaire. Without them, we do not provide outcomes. So this is how we are measuring how successful we are. So in lesson one, which introduces learners to the program, uh, what's expected of them, they kind of get a heavy dose of surveys. We do a couple of surveys and I'll touch on those as we get to measurable outcomes later. Uh, lesson five has to do with a, a checklist for kindergarten and how well is my kid doing? Uh, is this appropriate? And in lesson 15 they have an opportunity to write about their feelings about how well the program served them and um, you get to find out did, did this work? Um, and then there's some follow-up later when you send, resend a survey to get a post. Um, okay, so the guide. The guide has sections and it's divided by cardstock. These uh, dividers are heavier paper. They help you find what you need. At the uh, first section is, are the lessons and you are introduced to what's the list of the lessons, how do they progress, 
um, how to use them, the instructor's notes, the teaching guides. The masters follow the lessons so that when you're getting ready to do a lesson, you go to the master section and you find the handouts that you need for that lesson. The program materials section helps you organize your lessons. Well, I'm going to do lesson three. What in the world do I need to get together for lesson three? So we'll go into a little more detail about how to find what you need and how to gather those things when I cover the program materials section. And at the back of the book is the comprehensive list of books. It gives you uh, an introduction on how to find what you need in that list and the information that's provided on that list. With, of course, the great reminder that children's books do go out of print at the blink of an eye. So we do the best we can. The lessons. The lessons are organized based on pretty much what we do when we tutor an individual learner. We start with that learner's goal. And when you're tutoring an adult learner, you want to know what are your goals for tutoring? Why did you come and, and why do you want to tutor? And some learners will be very clear about their goals. I want to get a driver's license. I want to become a citizen. I want to pass my GED. Other learners really don't know what goals are and you have to spend some time with them helping them figure out what is a goal and what is a goal that's relevant for me. Well, the parents program begins the same way. After the introduction and orientation where you hopefully snag their interest and they say, yep, I like this program, this sounds good to me, I want to sign up for all the classes. Then you get into, right from the beginning, what are the goals that we have for our children? What kind of people do we want them to be? And pretty much every learner says, I want my children to have a good education. That's pretty much across the board. So once we know what it is that learners want for their children, then it's just pretty much a matter of how can you meet those goals and that's where the learning unfolds. So if I want my children to have a good education, what do they need? That's what I want from them, but what do they need for themselves? So we go over what children need, basic needs, secondary needs, and then um, the third level of needs are to grow and to learn. And a lot of those needs get met by reading a children's book together with your child. And it becomes very clear and very obvious very early in the program that learning how to do this with your child and doing it with joy and with success is a win-win all the way around. So if we want our children to get a good education and if we're their first teachers, how are they learning? What do we need to know about how children learn so that we can be effective teachers? So the program develops some very strong basic evidence about how children learn, makes it accessible to the learners so that they are informed teachers, so that they can be successful with their children. One of the things that we know as we move into lesson five is that as children learn language and they learn it at home, that this is a very powerful piece of being literate. And once learners understand how their children learn language, they can help them. And there's some very basic things that they can do that are not really hard. And one of them is to listen, and one of them is to restate something back. And those are all activities that happen in lesson five. In lesson six, we have the parent as teacher. Now, we've been developing this idea that parents are first teachers to their children, that they have ideas about what kind of adults they want their children to become. And so, what kind of teacher are you? And what are the ways that you can teach as an adult learner if you're not really a great reader? What can you do? So, in the, in the lesson on parent as teacher, we focus on play and the importance of playing games and how much you teach when you play games with your children. Another role that parents have as we learn in how children learn in lesson four is parents are role models. One of the primary ways that children learn is through imitation. 
and that's just hardwired. We imitate and we practice. We imitate and we practice. And what you imitate is what you see. And so parents have a tremendous influence on the development of their children in ways that many of them are very unconscious about. So parent as role model is an opportunity for parents to reflect on, hmm, what kind of a model am I? What kind of a model did I have? And what kind of a model would I like to be? From there, we move into probably two of the most challenging lessons in the guide, and probably you could do 15 lessons on communication and discipline models. These two uh, lessons have incorporated in this guide a wonderful video that's put out by what used to be uh, what used to be You Are My Child, and it is now Parents Action Network. So this, this video, which is 27 minutes long, 28 minutes long, raises a lot of issues, but it allows families to get the information in another way. So instead of reading and talking and writing, they now watch a video, and it becomes the basis of conversation. So it's a half hour video, it takes half of the session, and it stimulates a lot of conversation. From that session, we move on to discipline models. And what we tell learners is that we don't have the answers, but here are some things for them to consider. And we have a lot of handouts. We have a handout on um, spanking, and we have a handout on with cartoons that give examples of how to use alternatives to discipline, uh, alternatives to punishment, and what discipline provides that punishment doesn't. So those two lessons provide lots of grist for the mill, lots of conversation. This is a very sensitive area, which is why it comes in the middle of the program, when hopefully you have built a lot of trust among your participants and with you. From there, we move into the lesson on siblings, and this has to do with competition, how do you deal with, with sibling rivalry, uh, lots of wonderful children's picture books that deal with siblings, uh, the, particularly the ones by Kevin Henke's, which is Sheila Ray the Brave and Julius the Baby of the World. Those are both in the guide, and they're, they're just much fun to read. We move on from that to parent as advocate, and again, we go back to the concept that when your reading and writing skills are not really strong, often you're very hesitant to come forward and say, this is what my child needs. And when you're at school and you're dealing with teachers and you're dealing with administration, parents need to speak up and they are the primary advocate for their children in this system here and in many other countries that is not the case. Parents do not have a voice in the, edu the formal education of their children. They're very deferential to the teachers, but here we expect that. We expect parents to become involved and this is an encouragement for them to do this. This is um, a confidence builder lesson. Then we move on to peer groups and um, this can range anywhere from peer groups when you're in kindergarten to peer groups when you're a preteen. And the, the power of peer groups often leaves parents and caregivers kind of stumped. They don't really, how do I handle this? I've lost control over who my child is and what they're doing. Uh, so this, this lesson covers some of that and there's some wonderful handouts and some good books to read that provide perspective on this. Um, Willie's Not the Hugging Kind and um, Hunter's Best Friend at School are both great books that go in that lesson. From there we move into family history. Again, as in lesson seven, it's an opportunity to reflect on what was my family history, what would I like my, my children to have as a family history, and where is my role in developing that. So it's a time for uh, what are my values, the reflection, and the discussion, and the writing. Oddly enough, the last lesson before graduation is on reading aloud. And this is a, a, a time in class where learners can use everything that they've acquired so far in, their, in, in the course 
and read to each other using all the skills about asking questions, about playing rhyming games, about um, uh, having fun changing voices, about creating dialogue in wordless books. It's, it's a time, hopefully, that everything gets to blossom in, um, in that great, wonderful time of reading aloud. At graduation is when they've already ordered their gift book. You provide them with a gift book. They get to write about how the program worked for them, what, what would they have liked better, what was really great. They get their certificates. They get to have a few minutes to speak to the group. And usually it's a very powerful time. And you get a lot of nice outcome data. So the lessons. The lessons are organized. Each, less, each of the 15 lessons has two parts. There's an, the first section is the instructor's notes. And this is something you need to read before you actually provide the lesson. Each numbered area provides a different overview of what you're going to be doing. And hopefully it will explain to you why you're doing what you're doing and how you can prepare to present that piece of information during the class time. It's good to review that, to think about that, to make that yours. During the actual session, you'll be referred to the teaching guide. This is like an outline. It's kind of a cheat sheet. In the first column, it says procedure, and in the second column, it says objective. In the objective column is where you see the children's picture books covers here. Um, the procedure is what you actually do. You write on the board, you show the video. The objective side is why you're doing what you're doing. And this is what you want to accomplish when you write something on the board. You want to highlight the lesson. You want to give people a chance to talk about their home reading reports. You want learners to practice reading aloud. So the guide, the teaching guide, is organized in a way, hopefully, that makes sense to you, that will give you the rhyme and reason for what you're doing. As I said before, each lesson has handouts. Here's a sample of a couple of handouts. You'll see that at the bottom of each handout, it will give you the lesson number, and um, this one on the left is for lesson 12. It's handout two of two, side one. So they do not have page numbers on them in the handout, master handout section, but they do have a navigational tool at the bottom of each handout. The other handout here is a handout that you give to learners during lesson six on games and play. And it's about using your imagination. And it has some language that's a little bit difficult. So on the bottom, there's vocabulary words that are highlighted and can be discussed. So handouts range from, you can see the one on the left has way more text than the one on the right, um, so that you can challenge a range of learners. Again, if there's a handout that is too difficult, you may want to leave it out or you may want to read aloud in class the entire handout or selected portions of it. The program materials. What do I need to do to get my stuff together in order to provide this program? Well, in the, in the program materials section that starts on page 161, um, the first part of that is a list of parenting resource books. And there's some wonderful resource books that are available to you to make available to your learners. Some of them are difficult, but really valuable. These two books, which are How to Talk So Chil Kids Will Listen, How to Listen So Kids Will Talk, and Siblings Without Rivalry, I've taken some pages of those and used them as handouts. They're very dense and they're very difficult to read. Other resources are these wonderful pamphlets that go with the videos, particularly in lessons two and three and probably lesson four. These are only a dollar. You get them from that Parents Action Network that used to be uh, what is uh, My Child Foundation. I think that's what it's called. And the other ones are these great standbys 
from New Readers Press that have been around for a while and that continue to be really, really useful. My home is a learning place, you and your child's teacher, and the safe, self-confident child. These are extremely readable. They're geared to low literate parents and uh, very, very good things to have around for your learners to access. Other books that are used in the guide, this wonderful book on three minute, 303 minute games for infants and toddlers and it gives you reasons to do each game. So I highly recommend this book as a resource. Parents seem to really like that a lot. The other one, which is Games for Reading, is more difficult. That was where the handout on Use Your Imagination came from. So that's a lot of material that to go through. And what I've done on the next uh, section here is to put, to, to lay out everything on a two-page spread. And it goes for four pages. And it helps you find what you need pretty much at a glance. So that if I'm in lesson one, what do I need for my home book or my read aloud together book? I need this book. I need How Are You Peeling? Which is a great, um, a great hook. It's easy to look at, easy to read, it has rhyme, it's very engaging in terms of the visuals. There are recognizable objects. It's all fruits and vegetables. It's extremely creative, and it deals with emotions. So this is the one that we use in lesson one. It is the, it's the invitation to join the program. So on lesson one, it will be listed, how are you peeling as the home book or the read aloud together book? The show books will be listed, books that will also grab the attention of an adult learner that's particularly relevant to your population. It may be Brush Your Teeth, Please. It may be uh, One Yellow Lion. It could be an I Spy book. Anything that you think would get them interested in participating in the program. And those will be listed there under show books and pamphlets. The teacher read aloud book for lesson one happens to be this same book, How Are You Peeling? In many other lessons where you've already progressed into another topic, you will have that hardcover book that you buy only one copy of. And in lesson seven on role models, it's When Mama Gets Home. And this is a wonderful book about a single mom and her kids. And it is not available in paperback, and so it is a teacher read aloud book. The next column is the videos and the resource books. And some of the resource books I've just shown you, the pamphlets, the videos are, uh, three of them are from the Parents Action Network, Ready to Learn and the First Years Last Forever come early in the course. And as I said, the one on discipline comes later at lesson eight. And then the next column is the one that you're going to need to make copies of handouts. So which handouts do I need? How many do I need in order to provide enough in this lesson? So again, you, it will be listed if there's five handouts, there's one, two, three, four, five. And then you go to the handout master section and you find those and you make copies. So this is a wonderful navigational tool and I really encourage you to look that over pretty much before you begin to see, can I do this and which ones do I want to do? So let's move on to collecting outcome data. And this, I referred to this earlier as what do we have to show for what we're doing? And there are these four ways for us to collect hard data. The first is a pre and post test that measures changes in attitude. And you give that right at the get-go and you give it when you're finished. So what you're measuring is has this learner who's participated in my program changed any of their attitudes from the first day when they came in before they had any of the material that we covered in the course to the time when I'm finished? And even if you only do one evening and you present two lessons in a two-hour evening, you can give this first 
right as you come up and then right when you're finished. So you have some data to show for what you did for that one evening. The next is a familiar one to most of you, which is the Library Literacy Services uh, Family Literacy Survey. And it measures changes in behavior. So you do give that right away. But since we're measuring changes in behavior, we're much more interested in when you completed my course, when you had this instruction, how long did this change, did it change your behavior? Did you go to the library more? Did you read more with your child? So that's an actual change in activity. So we need to let enough time go by for learners to manifest that. So we suggest that you send that out four to six months after you've completed the program. The other introduction to this new guide that is extremely useful is the home reading report. And this is a handout that you give at the end of lessons two all the way through lesson 14. And it's the same handout. Learners become very familiar with it. And it has it gives them an opportunity to write about what they've done with the book that they've taken home and to quantify the amount of time that they've spent and spend a little time critically evaluating what they've done. The other area where you're going you're gonna to be able to get actual hard copy writing is in lessons 3, 5, 6, 7, 10, 13, and 15. And those are uh, handouts that you give in class on which learners write something and they can turn it into you. You can make copies and then they can keep it for themselves. So you actually have some hard data to show for what you've covered in the lesson. This is a quick look at the, the, the survey, the questionnaire in measuring changes about uh, attitudes about parenting. And there are questions that you're going to cover this material in the course. So it's really useful for you to know, was I successful in covering this material? And because learners are marking on a quantifiable scale from zero to five, zero being I don't know, uh, you, can, you can chart uh, a numeric data increase. So it's a very useful thing to use and you might consider actually creating something like that for other things that you provide, other programs that you provide. A uh, couple of typical questions, is it important for your child to see you reading and writing? You may think maybe kind of a two or a three when you start the program and you end up with a five. So you've made a gain of two or three points. Um, do you think it is useful to punish, punish by hitting or spanking your child? This one may not change at all. This one may be uh, a four. Yes, I do. I think, I think it is helpful to do that. So that's an area where you know that someone has a very strong value in that area and, and they think that that's, that's right for their, for their child. And then I think the two last questions are really valuable because a lot of times parents can come in thinking they already know, but when they're exposed to more information, they realize, well, you know, I, there's really a lot of information I didn't have. So do you have a good understanding of your child's physical needs, and do you have a good understanding of your child's emotional needs? So this is a very, very useful uh, tool, and I, I recommend that you, that you use it. The other one that I referred to, which is the measuring changes in behavior, is the one that we're most familiar with. And it has to do with how often do you read to your child? Do you go to the library with your child? How often do you do that? Um, I have added a question, do your children live with you? Because if you have learners who are in some sort of a setting, such as a rehab center, or they're divorced, or they're an uncle or an aunt or a grandparent, they're, if they don't live with the child, they're, they're frequency of reading with that child will be impacted. So I think that's a useful thing to learn. Here's the home reading report. This is something, as, as I said, that learners will be getting <laughs> after lessons two through 14. They will get very good at completing it. Um, it's an opportunity for them to 
practice, again, filling out a form, your name, your date, who participated in this, this activity that when you brought home the book, what did you do with the book, first I did this, this is what I would change, this is what I would keep the same. And then at the bottom there's an opportunity to do a little bit of math, how many people participated in the activity, adults and children, how long did they participate and you include the prep time and then you multiply and you get the number of hours that they actually put into this activity. So you've got another number that you can report um, as an outcome piece of outcome data. So the comprehensive list of books is pretty comprehensive. And what you find here, in, and there is a page just before the beginning of this, right after the divider page, that gives you, uh, it's the key, it's the legend about how to find what you need. In the first column, you get what the addition is. Is it a paperback? Is it a hardcover? Is it a board book? Is it a pop-up book? If it's, a, um, if it's a video, the price will be on there, or if it's a pamphlet, the price will be on there. The next is the, is the ISBN, so that you can order the paperback edition using that ISBN. It's also got, if it comes in hardcover, the hardcover edition ISBN is there as well. If it's a video or a pamphlet, you'll get a phone number. So if you want to order this, you call that number rather than using an ISBN, you use the phone number. The next column is the title of the book, the video, or the pamphlet. The ones that are in bold are the ones that are used in the lesson, either as an instructional book or as a teacher read aloud book. Uh, the show books are not in bold, but they do have the lesson number after them as do the ones in bold. And some show books are used in more than one lesson and those lessons will be listed right after the title. But again, they're not in bold. The next column is the author or the producer of the video or the pamphlet. The next column is the content. And hopefully it's helpful to you. It's hard to write content in a really short space. I've tried to include things that you might want to know. How you know? Is, are there simple sentences? How many words are, are there? Are a lot of words on the page. Um, uh, the illustrations are fabulous. Something that would give you a reason to buy this book for your collection or not. The next column is the child's age. For what age is this book appropriate and interesting and engaging? And then the last column is what is the reading level for the adult learner? Many are beginning, beginning intermediate, intermediate. Some of them are advanced, and the, the advanced ones tend to be all are the parent resource books. And those you may decide you don't want to make those available because they can be very overwhelming. So I hope that you have some sense of what the guide has to offer you, and I'd like to leave you with uh, a book that I'd like to read aloud to you. And the reason that I picked this book, Oh No, Gotta Go, is that it's got a lot of rhyme. It has uh, Spanish as well as English, and it's totally fun. And for no other reason than it's a fun book to read, I'm going to read it. So Oh No, Gotta Go. So on the first page, what we often do is we say, what do we think this book is about? Mm, oh no, gotta go? Hmm, could this be about going to the bathroom? Well, let's see. We get a little bit of a more of a clue here. We get a, a ladies' room, and we get a men's room. So. We were out driving down the Camino. Papa and Mama were dressed muy fino. The back seat was mine, my favorite spot, until I remembered the thing I forgot. Where is un baño? Donde esta? I really do need one, I told me, Mama. So here she is in the back seat, and the mom is turning around, and we can say, well, are they real happy about this? Probably not. Mi padres were talking, their voices down low. Didn't you ask her if she had to go? No, didn't you? 
Dad's ears became red, and you can see his ears are red. I'm sorry, lo siento. I meant to, he said. Don't worry, we'll find one, promised mi madre. Oh, I think I drank lots of juice, I said to mi padre. Don't worry, we'll find one, promised mi madre. Papa checked the bakery, la panaderia, but it wasn't open because of the dia. On Sunday, Domingo, the sign says cerrado. The baker is tired. He feels muy cansado. No haircuts today at the peluqueria. No shoes will be sold at the zapateria. But we'll find a bathroom, and quickly. Deprisa, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the cool brisa. And then there are pictures here of the bakery and the haircut place and the shoe store. So that's a great opportunity for the kids to look for the pictures. Now, I said loudly, in este momento, Papa saw a worker pouring cemento. He backed up to ask the big stranger, Etraño, rapido, mister, please, where is un baño? You go down the street, turn left at the banco. The one with the fountain, a white building, Blanco. Go down two more blocks, past the little red school. Then look for the restaurant, the blue one, Azul. Lots of cues here, colors, directions. So we turned at the bank with the fountain, La Fuente. Hurry, Papa! Mas rapidamente. We drove down a side street <clears throat> with nearly with newly built casas. We saw gardens with pumpkins, big orange calabazas. We passed the escuela and school bell campana. So quiet today, so noisy mañana. We pulled up at last to the blue restaurante, the fanciest building of all. Elegante. Papa, stop the carro. Mama, por favor. Abra la puerta. Please, open the door. We need, we need the baño with no time to dine. We rounded the corner and then saw, hmm, what do you think they saw? The line, and especially for the ladies' room. And look at all the little kids waiting to go to the bathroom. And again, we have the little dress that we can connect with from the beginning of the book. Mama grabbed my hand, con permiso, she said. She really can't wait. So they said, go ahead. I went to the baño, came out with a sigh, and thanked the nice ladies who let me go by. Some nodded, some smiled, some touched my cabeza. Then Dad found a table. He called out sorpresa, which is a surprise. So now they're going to have dinner. Let's eat here, he said. We'll order comida, and if you're thirsty, please choose a bebida. The waiter served sopa and then ensalada next chicken fried pollo and more limonada. Finally, for postre, he brought us some flan. But I was filled up from the special bread, pan. And here she is drinking lemonade. Hmm, what might that lead to? We paid for our meal, got into the car, drove down the Camino, but had not gone too far. When I asked me padres, papa, and mama, what is she going to say? Where is un baño? Donde esta? A great book. I highly recommend it. I hope that you undertake the parents program in some way that works for your literacy program and that you have a really good time doing it. Thank you.